EIC is a framework that stands for E is economy, I industry, C company. And it's really a framework <coughs> to help us understand the external factors that will influence the value of a stock. And what the data shows is about half of a company's performance is going to be determined by these external factors. Right? So that's why it's very important to do this analysis. So we're going to start out with the concept of E, which is the economy. And what's going to matter here is the idea of what we'll call economic sensitivity. So when the stock market, <coughs> sorry, when the economy changes, what's going to happen to the company's stock? All right? That's the real question we're trying to address with the E. Okay? So here's how we're going to use Bloomberg to help us with these questions. So in Bloomberg, <coughs> one of the things that you can do is <coughs> start typing in short codes. Right? So once you've logged in, and this is why you're getting certified, Bloomberg was created in the early 80s before the, the world of the mouse and the graphical user interface. So it's just a legacy where you can still type in text off of a keyboard to run the system. Right? So <clears throat> they have these short codes, two to four digits. And in this case, one of the short codes, if you start typing EC, at the top of the list it will show you the functions, in the middle of the list the securities, but EC is the economic data. And so, for example, if you type in EC, you can go to ECST, and that will get you world economic statistics. So, for example, I can get across all these data points all this economic data. So there's GDP for the U.S. Here's consumer price data for the U.S. Here's the labor market and unemployment data for the U.S. So every one of these things that you hear reported, they're right here at your fingertips in Bloomberg in real time. Okay, And that's, again, you get this under economic statistics. If you want to switch countries, you can look at it for any country in the world. Okay, So again, it's just a very handy way of getting your world economic data here. In addition, if you go to EC, and then you can go to the economic matrix, then it'll just give you like a quick view of all the major countries in the world and things like GDP, consumer price index, unemployment, central uh, bank interest rates, etc. So again, very good information. Now, two codes that are going to be of particular interest to us this semester. i got to remember what they are. ECSU is going to be one of them. Actually, I'll do that one next. EC, was it EC, FC, economic forecast. I'm going to start there. And I'm recording this so you can actually see these on screen. But here's the point. The EC economic forecast is literally that. We talked last week about how the analysts create consensus forecasts for the earnings of companies. Well, the economists create consensus forecasts for the data for countries. And Bloomberg aggregates the consensus of the economists. So this is for the United States. And again, you can choose whatever country you want or region you want and see not only historical data, but you can see forecast data. So in this case, for GDP, last year 2.2% US. Next year, 2014, expected to be 2.1%, 2015, 3%, 2016, 2.9%, unemployment by December, 6.2%, next year, 5.7%, year after that, 5.4%. This is kind of the consensus. So <clears throat> one of the things that we should be thinking about is that in good economic times, then what should happen is the market should do better, and in bad economic times, the market should do worse. So this gives us a sense of the economies, and we're dealing mainly with U.S. companies this semester, of U.S. companies. So that's the idea of here, we can quickly see for any economy what the economic outlook looks like. But here's the more important screen. It's called ECSU. Uh, up here. EC, Economic Surprise Index. So what Bloomberg has done is they've created this thing called the Surprise Index. And they've taken 54 
economic indicators, and they put them all in one screen. And if you check the box to group by sector, you can actually see it by sector, as opposed to just unfiltered. And I checked the box to group by sector. Right? Now, here's the thing. This shows housing data, industrial data, labor market data, personal spending data, retail information, and all the surveys, like consumer confidence surveys. As a matter of fact, last semester, I made the students go to the conference board to look up the leading economic index from the conference board. Well, there it is. It's one of the indicators in real time. And then here's the thing. What they do, take the leading economic index, is this is when it was released. They know the expectation for every one of these indicators based on the economist consensus. And then they have what they call the surprise, which is the variance versus the expectation. Green being positive surprise, red being negative surprise. Then they have this little chart of what happened to the S&P 500 after it was released within that first 30-minute period of time. So they can look at the reaction, right? So you can see the historical reaction when that number was released, generally available in the market, and then what happened to the S&P 500 index tick by tick right thereafter. But what's more, I think, interesting is they then took an index of these 54 indicators and they charted it against the S&P 500 change over time. So when you see red, these are negative surprises across all those economic indicators, and green are positive surprises. So here's the point. GDP might be expected to be 3%. If GDP comes in at 2.5%, that's still good. The economy is growing. But the problem is, as we talked about before, if people expected it to be 3 they priced it as if it was going to be 3%, and when it came in below, the stock market's going to fall. So what matters more is not the economic data itself, but how we do against expectation. This screen in Bloomberg is showing you real-time expectations and real-time data that's against all those economic factors against those expectations and what's happening with the stock prices. And this is the interesting thing over the last five years, which is of observable data, the orange line is the S&P 500 index, and you see it's relatively correlated to the economic surprises. Like when sentiment was getting worse, the market was going down. When sentiment was getting better, the market's going up, right, relative to expectations. So here's the point. <clears throat> Assumption, based on this observed data, we believe, or we will believe, that the stock market, think the S&P 500 in the U.S., is tied to the economy. So what we care about is what's happening to people's expectation about the economy is going to drive the stock market up or down. So therefore, on an individualized stock basis, how is my stock tied to the S&P 500? Is there an indicator that shows me the answer to that question? Is there an indicator that shows me how an individual stock is tied to the S&P 500? Yeah. Beta. So that's what we're going to use as our proxy for economic sensitivity of an individual stock. So let's take McDonald's. So I start typing in a company's name or ticker symbol. In the middle of the screen, it'll show me the filtered securities, in this case McDonald's. And then once I'm on a company, I could literally just type beta, the ETA. And there's a real-time beta of McDonald's, two years weekly default. Now, <clears throat> I went to Wharton a long time ago, and back then, we didn't have all these cool tools. We used to get what were called the Barra Beta Book, and every quarter it would come out. And when we had assignments, we were competitive. Somebody would go to the library and they'd steal it. So nobody else could do well because they'd either hide it or they'd rip the pages out. It was a brutal, vicious place. But in any event, <clears throat> I was biased towards five-year betas because that's what we used to look at in the Barra Book. It was always five-year betas. So... There's arguments for different terms, and I don't want to get into that. I'm just kind of used to looking at five-year betas, so I'm just going to mandate for this class five-year betas is what we care about. The reason that matters is Bloomberg defaults to two years. So we got to switch to a five-year beta, which means I come here to my, de my default date, and I switch this to 09, hit enter or go, and I now have a five-year beta for McDonald's. All right. Now, specifically, what it's going to do is it's going to regress the security, against the underlying index, 
that the security is in. Since we're dealing with U.S. companies, it'll deal with the S&P 500. Now, last night there was a news article that the chairman of Banco Santander has passed away, and that means there's probably activity in Santander stock today. But the interesting thing is when I work with Santander, Santander is like the second or third largest company in Spain, and Spain has a very small stock index, which doesn't have too many companies in it. So the problem is when you look at Spain's beta to Santander, it's like regressing against yourself, right? So the problem is you really wouldn't want to regress in a small country with not a lot of stocks, an individual stock, particularly the biggest ones in the country, against itself. So you might want to switch an index to like the Morgan Stanley World Index, ticker MXWO. But here's the point. For U.S. companies, the S&P 500 is pretty broad, so we usually use that by default. In your homework assignment, you won't have to change any of this. I'm just kind of giving you more of an FYI. But here's the point. Bloomberg gives you a raw beta, and Bloomberg gives you an adjusted beta over here on the right. The raw beta is just that. It's the slope of the trend line. Okay, that's the actual raw beta. The adjusted beta is a statistical argument because statisticians believe in regression to the mean, so they put in a regression coefficient with the beta. The way Bloomberg handles the regression coefficient is they take two-thirds of the raw and one, and then they do a weighted average. So they just basically take the raw beta and they move it one-third closer to the mean. All right? That's called the adjusted beta. So if you do, for example, cap M in Bloomberg, they'll use the adjusted beta by default. For our purposes, since what I care about is economic sensitivity, I'm going to suggest that we use the raw. Because what I really care about is when the market changes, how's my stock moving, actually, over the last five years? That's the raw beta. So for McDonald's, that number, 0.475. What does that mean? To have a raw beta of 0.475. Like for every like, dollar that the market goes up, it goes up 0.47. Yeah, I'd say more percent. But yeah, yeah. if the market goes up 1%, yeah. McDonald's goes up 0.475%. And if McDonald's, if the market goes down 1%? Down like oh. That's right. So it's not going to go up nearly as fast. It's not going to go down nearly as fast. Right? So what does that mean in terms of risk? Low risk. It's a lower risk than the average stock. Everybody see that? So somebody might consider McDonald's a safety stock. Now let's just think about this intuitively. Why might McDonald's have a low beta intuitively? Yeah. They sell inferior goods, so. <laughs> inferior? Really? Okay. I'm just curious. Well, like, so, like, in bad economic times, people still eat there and still, like, like they're not going to collapse immediately. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, like, the economy, but why don't they do so well in good economic times? Because people will go eat at, like, fancier restaurants when you have lots of money. Yeah. I, I, I could buy that argument. So, basically, at McDonald's, when economic times are tough, the dollar menu looks more attractive. When economic times are good, you move up to Chipotle or something like that, fast casual. So, but that's the point. McDonald's is going to be a relatively steady performer. This is going to be important when we forecast cash flows because eventually we're going to have to forecast companies and companies that have these relatively low betas can probably have almost like a trend line forecast as opposed to a much volatile line forecast. So that's going to also influence our forecast. But by the way, McDonald's was in the news last week. What happened to McDonald's? They actually reported terrible sales. Was it because of bad economic activity in the rest of the world? It was actually attributed to poor execution in China. That they had some sort of issue with one of their suppliers in China, and it really hurt them pretty badly. And their same source sales were way down. And it was completely unexpected, and their revenue was way down. But that would be the point. I wouldn't expect that McDonald's is going to have a big jump in their same store sales because of economic activity because they have a low beta. If they have a big jump in their sales up or down, it's probably because of something else. And that's exactly what happened in McDonald's. It was the something else. They had some execution issues, which really hurt them last quarter. So <clears throat> here's the point. What about Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines? Second largest cruise line operator in the world. We're going to look at their beta in a second, but what do you think? Is it going to be high or low? 
Why? Why might it be high? Yes, yeah, a little bit more of a luxury good. So generally, we don't go and experience luxury when we're in a recession, and we tend to spend more on travel and leisure when we have good times, so we'd probably expect them to have a high beta. All right, well, let's see. Here's Royal Caribbean, U.S. equity. Then I type in beta, and then I go to buy five years, 09, hit enter or go. And over the last five years, beta almost two, 1.974. So <clears throat> this is what would be expected, but nonetheless, I could say they're much more economically sensitive. So when I forecast Royal Caribbean eventually, I probably don't want to forecast a straight line for them as well. They're going to probably be a much more cyclical company, and that should inform the way that my forecast would actually be delivered. Now, here's the thing. As part of your homework exercise, I'm going to give you a company. It won't be these two. It'll be another one. And you're going to have to go get their beta, and you're going to have to explain whether or not they're economically sensitive. You're going to have to have a screenshot to back it up, because in this class, you actually have to show with data your assumptions. Okay, so you can't just state things. There's no just asserting things. You gotta have data to back it up. So you're gonna have to upload a screenshot of your five-year beta. So here's how you do it very easily. In the upper right-hand corner of just about every screen in Bloomberg are these icons. And one of the icons, if you hover over it, says export. And if you click on the export button, one of the options is to save screen as file. So literally it'll take a screenshot and it'll save it as a GIF file somewhere that you put it. You can also grab the screen, which is basically copy it and then paste it somewhere. But I think it's just easier to save the screen as a file. So you click on save screen as a file and then save it somewhere, hard drive, thumb drive, whatever, because you're going to have to upload this as part of your assignment. Now, the convention that I use to save the name is I call it the ticker symbol, RCL. I put a dash and then the, the four digit Bloomberg code beta. All right, you can name it whatever you want, but when I save things, just so you have a little bit of a roadmap, I'll give you the name of the company and what the symbol was in Bloomberg to get to that screen. So that way it'll help you a little bit. But nonetheless, I save it. And I'd already created one of the earlier sections. So I come back here, I go to my downloads folder, and there is the screenshot that we just took. Right. Now, one thing about it, just so you know, at the bottom of every screenshot is the serial number, time and date stamp of the machine when you took it. So you really shouldn't be using other people's uh, time and date stamps and unique serial numbers because we'll know that if you turn in somebody else's homework, it wasn't your own. Okay, that's how we catch you. So don't do it. When I say individual assignment, you should each be individually taking the screenshots. Don't trade them because we'll know that they were traded and we can track it back to who originally traded it. Makes it really easy to go to the honor council. XFs are bad on your transcript. All right, so back to this. Um, <clears throat> this is the E section of the EIC. The next thing we're going to want to do is the I, which is the industry analysis. Now, in this class, we're going to define industry attractiveness very specifically. It's not subjective. It's not, oh, I think this is a good industry. It's objective. It's observable. <clears throat> and specifically, this is a finance class, so an attractive industry is one where you make money. Specifically, create value or have positive NPV. The way you have positive NPV, IRR greater than discount rate. Translation, ROIC greater than WAC. That is an attractive industry. An unattractive industry, negative NPV, ROIC less than WAC. That's what we're calling spread. So the industry attractiveness is based on the observable industry spread. And it's not the historical spread, it's the current spread. That's what we're going to care about. Okay? And the future spread. This is the valuation class, right? So <clears throat> this is important because you can't let your biases get in the way of your view of industry performance, right? So I was teaching this class a couple semesters ago in the part-time MBA program, and one student just could not get over the fact that airlines are a terrible business, right? And one of the reasons he couldn't get over it beyond his own personal experience, 
was that the book had this graphic in it. And he'd read the book. And what it showed is the ROIC performance and then the, the variance um, of different industries over a very long period of time. And the airlines were the worst performing industry historically. And based on his own point of view, based on a Harvard Business School case study he had done in a previous class, and this data, he believed that airlines were a terrible business. But if you actually looked at the airline industry today, the airlines are actually doing pretty well. Right? So historically, yes, they've been a terrible business. But today, the airlines are doing pretty well. Matter of fact, last week, probably for political purposes, the Congress announced they're investigating the airlines for making too much money. Right? Because people are complaining about all the fees that they're charging, and their fees are leading to record profits for the airlines. Right? But that's the point. The fees are making the airlines a lot of money right now. It's actually a much more attractive industry than it was historically based on the observable data today. So what we're going to care about is what is the industry ROIC? What is the industry WAC? I'm going to show you how we get that data. So we're going to go to Bloomberg. And I'll go back to McDonald's. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a section called RV, which stands for relative value, relative valuation, which allows me to very quickly compare one company against a bunch of its peers. Okay, So I'm going to go to the RV section. And this is McDonald's against its publicly traded peers. Now, by default, Bloomberg is going to actually load in the GICS peers. All right. And GICS is the Global Industry Classification Service. So basically, the, the government standard classifications for companies, they put you in these buckets. And then these are the buckets that are just standardized. And you also could use this general industry classification. At least maybe it's general industry classification. Whatever it is. It's a standard industry classification. Uh, and then you can do it by, in this case, country of domicile. So since McDonald's is a U.S. company, it would show it against its U.S. peers. If I wanted to go global, I could look at the global peers. I could look at peers in Europe, Asia, whatever. By default, for this simple exercise, we're going to use the U.S. peers. So country of domicile for the company that I give you. And then here's the other thing. Instead of the GICS classification, we're going to use the proprietary Bloomberg COMPS stands for comparables. So under COMP source, make sure you change this to Bloomberg COMPS. Okay? The reason why is the Bloomberg COMPS is a curated list. Right? So the default list is just the government standard classification. The Bloomberg COMPS is somebody went through at Bloomberg and they said, we don't think that this is the right list. We think these companies should be subtracted and these companies should be added based on our view of what the analysts seem to actually be tracking about their peers. So the Bloomberg list is probably a more reasonable list that Wall Street would be looking at. So we're going to use the Bloomberg list. Now, even if you choose the Bloomberg list, you don't have to use the Bloomberg list in the future for this homework assignment you do. But in the future, you can come down here, edit, and then you can decide to get rid of companies by unchecking them or adding them by just typing in their symbols here, create your own custom lists. But for purposes of this assignment, we want to use the Bloomberg peers in the U.S. for whatever company I give. McDonald's is the working example. By the way, up top actions, I can hide the top section. So this is McDonald's against some random set of numbers. Now, these are some predefined templates across the top. And then I go away over here and I go to custom. Custom allows me to choose what variables I want to compare against. So we're going to go to custom. And what I care about is two pieces of data. Number one, I care about the ROIC. Number two, I care about the WAC. So I come in here to add column, and I type in ROIC, and there's return and invested capital. So hit enter, select it, and then it'll ask me which period of ROIC do I want, because I can actually go back historically and look at a historical ROIC. Well, the period that I'm going to care about in my template it's not the customized period, it's the latest year, right? as opposed to the latest calendar year. And the difference, the reason why we're using the latest year is it's the last annualized year of the company. Not everybody does a January, sorry, uh, December 31st close. 
right? So by doing latest year, it's the latest fiscal year for the company. So I choose latest year, I hit enter or go, and there it is. ROIC colon Y for the latest year, right? The reason why this is also important is when I save this template, anytime I load it, it will always give me the latest year. So if I go a year from now and I load this template again, it'll give me the 2014 data. Okay, right now it's giving me the 2013 data because it always says pull the most recent annualized data. Then I come back to add column and I type in WACC. In Bloomberg, there is only one WAC. It is the current WAC on this screen. So there's the WAC. So current WAC against latest ROIC, there's my spread for the publicly traded companies that are McDonald's Bloomberg peers. Essentially, I now have an industry with $28 billion of revenue here. <clears throat> All right, so next I go to select stats, and I can choose some stats to do against this list. I don't do the average. We're going to choose the market cap weighted average. And the reason we're going to do the market cap weighted average is we do not want a small company to distort the average. So we're going to do an average based on the size of the company, based on their market app, market cap. So again, market cap weighted average, hit update, and there it is across the top. So here's what I know about the restaurant business that McDonald's Pierce competes in, basically fast food and fast casual, is the average ROIC is 21.63%, the average WAC 7.85%. Is this an attractive industry? Very. Okay, so I can quickly see that this is an attractive industry based on observable data. Now I'm missing private companies, right? And the two best fast food <laughs> private companies are not on this list. Let me know who they are. Number one and two. You can't even argue. It's indisputable who the two best fast food private companies are. West Coast, in and out If you don't know what that is, talk to your West Coast friends. <clears throat> and then Southeast, so their founder just died? Chick-fil-A. Chick okay. So I'm just telling you, they're not on this list. I know it's tragic, but other than that, these are the publicly traded companies. So back to this. <clears throat> is this an attractive industry? Yes. That's going to be our definition spread for the industry as to whether or not it's attractive. Finally, save the template. Click on the Save As button, name the template. I think you'd have up to 10 characters in the name. So I might call this 443 spread or something like that. Hit Save. Now I'd saved it in the previous class, so it's going to overwrite it. Hit OK, and then it'll create a little button on my screen with the Save template. So every time I click on the button, it'll load this template. So here's the deal. I go to Southwest. Love is their ticker symbol. <clears throat> I go to RV. I go to Bloomberg Peers. I go to Custom. Click on my template. There it is. The one thing that's annoying is it doesn't save the stats that I chose. So I have to go back to select stats and market cap weighted average again. Is the airline industry attractive? Not as much. Is the airline industry attractive? If we define it as spread, yes. Now, I agree. Not as attractive as fast food, <coughs> but <clears throat> it is attractive nonetheless. Everybody see that? There's a problem. That's right. Because one is uh, in bankruptcy right now. <laughs> American. <clears throat> and I think Delta was losing money. So, yeah, there's some issues when it's not available. So I don't disagree with you, but it's just kind of a quick screen that we're going to do. I probably wouldn't use the airlines for a homework assignment. So good point. So let's go back and look at fast food. Or fast casual. So RV. <clears throat> Spread. Select stats. Market cap. Make sure I'm looking at the Bloomberg peers. 
By the way, actions, I can hide the top if I want to get it all on one screen. And then finally, export save screen as file. This is the second screenshot you're going to have to take. So I'll call this MCDRV. So you're going to need two screenshots for your homework assignment. You're going to need the beta and you're going to need the RV. Okay. On a different company than McDonald's. But <clears throat> back to this. Competitive advantage. In this class, we're going to define competitive advantage very specifically. And the way we're going to define it is relative performance to your peers. Okay? So it's not are you creating value or are you destroying value? It's are you outperforming your peers? That is competitive advantage. All right? So that's the point. Everyone in this room is very smart. But by definition, half of you are not as smart as the other half. Now, I'm not going to go there beyond making that statement. That's not a fun statement that we want to get into, but it is a truthful statement mathematically. Same thing is true in the real world when we evaluate companies. Like, this industry is a great industry, but by definition, most of the players are doing well and some of the players are not. So we have to define which ones are doing better on a relative basis, okay? So <clears throat> that's competitive advantage. And what I want you to start to think about <clears throat> when we evaluate companies is that basically, is the company doing well because they're in a good industry or is the company doing well because they're doing really well against their peers? And I want to start making that determination. So let's talk about Mickey D's. <clears throat> Does McDonald's have competitive advantage using the relative definition? What's the industry ROIC? What's McDonald's ROIC? Are they outperforming the industry ROIC? Let's look at it a different way. What's the industry spread? ROIC minus WAC, approximately. Call it 13, 14, depending on how you round. What's McDonald's industry spread? 13, 14. Are they really doing better than the industry? Not really. So one could make an argument <clears throat> that McDonald's, now again, embedded in this list are what we would call fast casual, not pure fast food. But as an investor, that's the way I'm choosing. I'm choosing between McDonald's and Panera. I'm not just choosing between McDonald's and Burger King. But nonetheless, McDonald's is doing well because they're in a good industry, not necessarily because they're the best company in the industry. Does everybody see that? Who has competitive advantage? And it could be more than one. Domino's kind of jumps out at you. All right? Anybody know why? It's not the reinvention. I'll, I'll give the same story I gave earlier, even though it's on YouTube. I think the statute of limitations is probably passed. But <clears throat> when I was 17 years old, I illegally delivered pizza for Domino's. Right? <clears throat> because basically the franchisor went to my high school and just recruited a bunch of youngins to basically deliver pizzas. And it was great because back in the early 1980s, <clears throat> when I was, you know, Closer to your age. I'm getting old now. But uh, basically, minimum wage was like three thirty-five an hour, and I was making like $12 an hour in high school. And the reason why is because you got tips, and they paid you for mileage. So it was great, right? But technically, you had to be 18 years old, and I was started working there when I was 17. Plus, they had the 30-minute guarantee. So we were driving like crazy people to make that 30-minute <laughs> guarantee, because otherwise, you got the pizza for free. And back then. And then so basically you had to be there in thirty minutes. There's a lot of pressure. Yeah. I don't remember that. I don't remember when the Noid was. It could have been. But but here's the point. The reason why they were able to do this was because and that was the key word, it was a franchisee. It was a renegade franchisee who was not really following and enforcing company policy that you had to hire people that were minimum eighteen years old. And that's where I learned very quickly that McDonald's is a bunch of franchisers, and it's almost 100% franchised. 
So, or sorry, Domino's. Domino's is almost 100% franchisees. So that's the point. Why is Domino's, the publicly traded parent, doing so well? They don't own any of the stores. They don't own any of the equipment. They don't have to pay any of the people. All they're doing is collecting the licensing fees and basically marketing and branding that, and they're just like a reservation system for online orders today. That's why they have a phenomenal ROIC. The franchisees themselves are not making nearly this money, but that was the point. That's the way they set up. Now, what's interesting is McDonald's has some franchisees. McDonald's also has a bunch of company-owned stores. And so if you actually look at McDonald's, it's a mix of both. Right? They're doing well, but not nearly as well as somebody that's almost 100% franchise. What about Burger King? They own most of their stores. So here's some insight into, I don't have anything other than this speculation, but why might Warren Buffett and 3G Capital be interested in Burger King beyond the taxes? What do you think they're going to start doing? They're going to start franchising it. It's an easy money because what I see is, hey, if I start looking anywhere close to McDonald's, I can take an underperformer and suddenly just get me to average and think about all the upside there and all the cash that I can take out by selling a bunch of franchises. And I don't have to improve the performance of the stores that do this. So I'm not saying that's the rationale they did it, but I'd be strongly surprised if that wasn't part of their business case for why they bought them in private equity. It's not just about moving the tax address. It's also about relative performance to their peers, and they're underperforming, but they're probably not just poorly run. There's probably some execution issues. I think there's probably some easy money there to be made, and that's what the private equity firms are probably looking at. But again, I'm just saying, that aside, does Burger King have competitive advantage? No, clearly not. What about um, Papa John's? Competitive advantage? Yeah, it looks that way. What about uh, Texas Roadhouse? No, but they're making 13%. But the industry is making 20, 21. See, that's the point. Is Texas Roadhouse creating value based on this data in this period of time? Yes. But are they really showing competitive advantage while creating value? No. So what I'd say is they're in a good place because they're in a good industry, but they're not one of the better run companies in that industry. That's the way I want you to start thinking about this. Does that make sense? Okay. So <clears throat> here's the point. Once you've identified and taken the screenshot, whether they have competitive advantage and whether or not it's a good industry, you're going to write this up. Okay. But then you got to give a rationale. Why is this such a good industry? So that goes back to Porter Five Forces. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to do a five forces assessment. Here's the five forces, for those of you who remember them. And you have to write up, using the five forces assessment, why it's a good or bad industry. Explain, using the five forces. Okay, That's going to be part of your assignment. All right. Now, for the industry that I give you, you might not know a lot about that industry. So to help you, remember this is a real world class. We're using complete real world data here. You can go to Canvas. The last link on Canvas is VBIC. If you go to VBIC, you go to the Industry tab, there's a data source called IBIS World. IBIS World is Industry Research Reports okay, for U.S. and global companies. You type in the company or industry name. In this case, I'll type in McDonald's. Hit Enter and it'll show me all the industry reports that McDonald's is in. Now, obviously, we're probably not talking about cereal, donut shops, tax preparation franchisees. Why they'd be in that one, I have no idea. But fast food is probably the right industry report. I click on fast food, there's an entire 30-odd page PDF downloadable industry report where they've basically done a five forces analysis. So you're welcome to reference the data. Don't plagiarize, reference. But under here, an industry outlook is pretty much where they've kind of talked about this. Right? By the way, later, when you go to key stats, you'll also see that they do things like forecast industry revenue, forecast industry profitability. So that could be useful information for future exercises as well. But nonetheless, this will help you as you work on this assignment.
Okay. Final part. I want you to predict the future. <clears throat> so, just as a quick example. This data, and I don't want it to confuse you, comes from your reading in the book this week. And what McKinsey did is they looked at about 40 historical years of data, and they ranked different industries based on historical ROIC over a long period of time. I don't want you to confuse it with this assignment, because this assignment's about observable data for today, not how they've done in the past. Right? But notice, what is the top industry historically based on this 40-year time horizon McKinsey looked at? Pharmaceuticals. Thinking in context of the five forces, why might pharmaceuticals have done so well historically? I think the number one reason is patents, which goes into which of the forces? I, I might call it, you could call it barriers to entry. You could also say it limits buyer power because it limits your choice. You could also say that it limits rivalry, so it could go across several of these. But I think you've identified, I think, the most important reason why the pharmaceuticals make money is they're virtual monopolies when they have patent protection. What's ironic is the pharmaceutical companies today only have 10% of their drugs that are sold under patent protection. 90% are generic, yet many of them are still reporting record profits because of the ridiculous prices on that 10%. Right? And the fact that even as the government has been clamping down, as, as they've tried to, to increase generics, we've gone from 80% generic to 90% generic, yet their margins have actually improved because the 10% they have left, they're charging even more for. Because they know that if you have cancer, you're going to pay whatever it costs to get that cancer drug, and they charge for it accordingly. So they exercise that power. Now, if you're a pharmaceutical firm, and I work for some of them, it's not like they're saying that, hey, we're not just doing this because we want to take advantage of people. Like, there's a lot of research, and the statistics for pharma are horrible. Ten years of three of $1.3 billion of R&D with only a 5% chance of success. So they need a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, or else it doesn't really make sense to make these long bets. All right? But it's hard to explain that to the average person. When you walk into the Walgreens, you get the sticker shock for the price of the drugs. But here's the point. That's one of the reasons why the farmers are relatively profitable. Look at the bottom of this list. What's the worst performing company over this 40-year period? Performing industry. Airlines. airlines. Why are the airlines doing well today where they haven't been doing so well historically? Yeah. What's happened to competition in the airline industry? Yeah, we've seen through consolidation, we're down to four major airlines that control over 80% of all passengers. And so you just don't have a lot of choice. Matter of fact, I, I think I told you, I'm flying to Australia. You know how much my ticket's going to cost to go to Australia? $14,000. Now, they're flying me business class, thank God. It's a 15-hour flight from L.A. to Sydney. So I get one of those little lie flat things. But, I mean, I could buy a car. I could, you know, buy a, I could lease a pretty nice condo for a year for that 15-hour flight. That's there and back. But in any event. But that's the point, because there's not a lot of choice. And it's peak season in Australia, for whatever reason. So <clears throat> it's ridiculous, but they can charge that because there's not a lot of choice. And there's not that many seats on the plane. So it's all supply and demand. But here's the other reason why airlines are making more money. It's called fees. Is that airlines now charge huge fees as opposed to the fares on the average flight. And that's actually what has hurt Southwest. If you think about the Southwest data that I showed you, Southwest isn't performing very well right now because Southwest <coughs> doesn't charge fees. You know what the number one performing airline is by ROIC? It's not U.S. Air, which is now American. Who charges fees the most, the most fees of any airline? Spirit. Love them or hate them, and apparently we don't like them, but we still fly them which is the ironic part. But if you go and I'll look at Southwest as an example, and you look at the RV section, and we look at the custom screen that we just did, you'll see that Spirit actually has the highest ROIC of any airline, where Southwest only earns 6% has a negative spread. 
And what started to happen a few years ago is now the airlines make more than half of their profits based on the fees they charge. And Southwest decided not to charge fees. So believe it or not, that, which gets them great customer satisfaction ratings and has made them the number one carrier by volume, has killed their stock price because they're not charging fees. And the airline that we love to hate and still fly is the one that's gouging us, yet they're making lots of money because we buy based on the fare, not based on the fee. And what happens is even if you fly and you pay the fees, you still shop on the fare next time without the fee because we don't have good information about the fees. And that's actually one of the things the government is trying to change right now that the airline lobby is fighting against is to get transparency on the, fear, the fees so you actually know what you're really going to pay when you fly the flight. And the airlines don't want you to see that because that's how they're making a lot of money. But that's the point. The industry changes. So here's the long story short. The final part of your homework assignment is you're going to do the RV screen. You're going to say whether the industry is attractive. You're going to do a five forces explaining why the industry is attractive or not that I give you. Then you're going to look into your crystal ball and you're going to tell me whether the industry is going to be more, less, or the same attractiveness five years from now. Now, I can't ask you to give me a specific prediction on ROIC or spread in five years. So what I'm going to ask you to do is give me a prediction on the five forces. So basically, are the five forces industry structure that you define today going to change in five years? Because if the industry structure stays the same in five years, then the industry spreads going to stay about the same in five years. If the industry forces are getting more favorable for the industry, then the industry should be more profitable in five years. If the industry forces are getting worse, the spread in the industry should get worse. So what I really want you to do is predict the change in the five forces five years and infer what that would mean to the spread of the industry. So it's not precise for the numbers, but it's directional. And this is laying the groundwork so that when, again, we forecast cash flows for the valuations, we're going to essentially be forecasting ROICs, and this will help us make a check on which way those ROICs should be forecast. 